we're going to do a crash course for Lua programming for people who already know how to code in another language. So to start things off, why are we using Lua and what's it used for? It's a lightweight language that is pretty easy to embed into a C or C++ code base. That means that it's a scripting language that's interpreted at runtime. So there's few different versions. We have 5.3, 5.2, 5.1. And there's some very small differences on the Lua side of scripting on the C plus side, which we're not really covering in this. And we're only looking at the scripting for it is there's quite big differences on the C side. So for good for us, we're only looking at the scripting. Now, what I would recommend if you are looking at documentation online that make sure in the URL, it says 5.3, because when you Google search things, you'll often get old references from different versions or else whatever version of Lua that you're currently using. That's a very common mistake that people do, but we're not gonna look at direct of the official documentation. Instead, I've made a cheat sheet, which will go through things a lot better. And some of the documentation is very bloated and written kind of like an essay or a big book. So for printing stuff out, you have a function called print. You have the round brackets, very similar to a lot of other languages out there like C sharp, Java script or Java, C, C++, whatever. But comments are quite different. Instead of two forward slashes, we use two minus signs. For variables, this is a dynamically typed language. So there's no strong types. So if we want to define a type, we use local x equals 10, local name equals John Doe, and we can have strings, numbers, and decimal points. There's no doubles. There's Everything's just a number string. Uh, we have a boolean and there's also instead of null we have nil this means no value or invalid value there's a couple of other types but these are the basic types that you're using for most stuff now if we look at the numbers we also have the operators addition subtraction multiply divide power and modulus and for example here we have one multiplied by three multiplied by four and we can do the same things with round brackets a similar arithmetic you would have with numbers in other languages so now moving on to strings if you want to concatenate strings instead of using a plus sign you need to use dot dot like a full stop this is very important if you don't do this you will get compilation errors if you use a plus sign with booleans you can also set them to true or false uh, conditional statements with if statements. This is where the syntax gets quite different to what other languages use. If age is less than 18, then end. So we're not using those curly brackets that you would see in a language like C or JavaScript or anything like that. It, you're instead using the then keyword and the if keyword. So this is the end of your, your statement goes in here and the end of your if statement ends here. Now this would be a equivalent to the closing bracket of your if statement. Then when we want to do an else if and else, the else if has no space between it and it also requires a then after you've written your conditional statement. In this case, is age is equivalent to 18. Now for comparison operators like equivalent, we use two equal signs. There's also less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than, equal to, which is pretty straightforward, but inequality, which is not equal to, which is often exclamation mark and an equals sign. Instead, we use this symbol, which is a, a tilde equals for inequality. So combining statements is also another quite weird thing as well, where instead of two and percents for an and, we use the keyword and and the keyword or for and and or. That's just, you don't use the two vertical lines either for the or. With nested statements, it ends up being similar where we have to use the end and this block here is the inside if statements and this end is related to this if statement. So you end up having ends tabbed out as well, similar to what you're doing with your brackets. And inverting values, if not x is equivalent to 10, then print here. So not is how you invert the Boolean value of this conditional statement. So this is also another keyword instead of the exclamation mark, which is used for inverting. Now with functions, we also use the end keyword to end the function. This ends up being very similar to what we have in other languages. 
where we have a function, the function name and the variables, or sorry, the parameters that we're going to have. And functions also can have multiple values, which you put a comma between them. And they're really just uh, very simple stuff. You can return values too, which is like return this here for our function here called calculate price. We can return this price multiplied by 21% or 0.21. So scope is also apparent in Lua. So if you declare a variable A inside of this function, once you get to the end, that uh, variable A is no longer accessible. And if you print it out, you will get nil, meaning that the value hasn't been declared yet, equivalent of that. Now there's also global variables. So if you put it at the top of your file, underscore g dot before your name of your variable it will create a global variable called my value these are sometimes bad practice and sometimes they're pretty much okay for some uh, areas of what you're doing uh, very dependent but it's good to know because if someone else writes this variable you can understand what that code means now with loops this is some of it is similar for while loops we use a condition and we have the do keyword and the end keyword. So this is our while and we just loop through this. Now for for loops, it's somewhat a little bit different and for i equals one and we're gonna loop until a maximum of five and do this and we're gonna end. So the loops start at one in this case of so five and you can set, if you put another comma after this, you can say, increment by two, increment by 10, or whatever. But by default, when you have a for loop like this, we have uh, just an increment of one per each time in the loop. Now you can also have infinite loops, which will never end. And you can also do nested loops. Now in this scenario here, it's often a good idea to have a different variable name for the inner loop, even though it's valid to write a equals one, and it will in this case, what we're doing here is we're looping 10 times this time on the inner loop, then we're looping another 10 times and it's counting each time that we're in this loop. So it should print out 100. Often, if you change this to A, it will also count to 100. But just for better readability of code, I would highly recommend putting different names for your different loops that are nested. Now, tables come on to be a pretty substantial part of Lua, this is a way of storing data uh, in different ways. So you might be aware of arrays or objects. Lua doesn't have either of those. This is kind of the closest thing that it has and they're used very similar to that. So for example, here we have colors, which is uh, in this case, just a table, like a one you could think for almost like a row or something like that, or an array is probably the closest thing, but we don't have to have just string values in here. We can have numbers. We can also have booleans in here too. And any other type, we can even have a table within a table, which we'll be looking at in the next actually. So if we want to iterate through this table, we have for i equals zero and uh, hash colors do and what hash colors is the number of colors. This means the length of this table. Now this is where Lua gets kind of weird in comparison to other languages. And probably the biggest thing to stand out from other languages is that Lua starts counting at one. It does not count at zero. So this first index here is one. This index is two, this index is three. So we're starting our loop at one then we're going to two, and all the way to tree and we're going to print out each color and it will print out red green blue in this case now we're going to look at table manipulation which is if we want to insert something to a table there's a function called table dot insert and we need to pass in the name of the table and insert the value that we're putting in and we can print that out then afterwards and this will automatically put that variable orange at the very end. Now, if we want to put this variable in a very specific location, here is our function here where we put in a value of two and it will put it in at index two, which in this case we'll put red, then we'll put pink in here at position two and then green and blue. So we also might want to remove a variable from our table. So in this case, we have table.remove colors at index one 
this will remove red from the colors table. Now two dimensional tables can sometimes be useful but are often bad practice if you're dealing with varying different types because there's a better solution that's coming next. Uh, but for now with two dimensional tables, this is just an example or proof of concept of this. You can even do three dimensional tables if you want. And I think you can go even further. <laughs> How many dimensions you can get is up to yourself. But readability and usability of this code becomes harder and harder if you're varying different types between say strings and numbers and this is how you define a two-dimensional table and you can access this two-dimensional table through uh, the square brackets and then the second when you're accessing the next inside that table is the next square brackets so what ends up being better than two-dimensional table is keyed tables if you're familiar with uh, json objects or something like that this is very similar to that uh, and this is essentially where on the left side you have keys on the right side you have values and what ends up being up where we have a key called team a and it's equal to 12 team b is equal to 15 and we can set this to be a string value if you want and you can even set the right side to be equal to another table and that ends up being better to pass like find your values and store them uh, something the equivalent that you might have up where it would be like a list of objects instead you would have like a keyed table which might be much easier to deal with so then if we want to loop through this uh, keyed table it ends up being a little bit different so instead what we need to do is use pairs so this is a pair loop and what you can do is this the syntax so key will be set to the left side so this is going to be a variable the right side is going to be set to a value which in this case is going to be team a is equal equal to key and value is equal to 12. so we print these out and it will loop through the table each time and the second time it will set key to be team b and value to be 15. Now we can also insert new values to this table a little bit afterwards here by just literally using uh, this syntax where we have uh, a string value in between for almost like the index that we're using. And if we want to remove something from a table, there is no remove function. Instead, you, well, you can kind of remove them, but it's generally preferred and much easier to do to use an equal sign for equals nil. And this is the fastest and easiest way to remove a key from the table. And this will also remove the value as well. So it's uh, uh, very easy to do. Now, what also becomes very valuable for tables is that you can return them from functions. This is almost the equivalent of returning an object from a function. So this allows you to return multiple values. And this is uh, very useful and just something that take into account rather than just having one value to return. Now Lua also has a mat library that's built in and if we have a quick look at that uh, here these are all the functions that are available in the mat library such as absolute value you have um, the ceiling the floor rounding up and down and a bunch of other ones there as well. So if we go back to our guide here just as an example we can just call the function mat.abs and passing a which is equal to 10 and it will result in 10 because it's just getting the absolute value and this ends up being the same for every other function like mat.ceiling which rounds the number up and you pass in x which is 1.2 and you will get uh, the rounding up so this is like the mat library an example but the other one that becomes useful is requiring functions from other uh, files or requiring other files. This is where modules come into place. So modules is a, a good example here is that I have two files here and the first file is called test.lua and it has a function called hello world. If I go to my main.lua which is my main file I can require it with test now and then call the function message. Now if I on if I run this, it will call hello world. But let's go back a step and say, comment this out. If I call this function message, we don't know where it is right now. We run it and we'll give an error. Now, if we uncomment this and we require our function that's in this other file and we run it now, it will know where it is and write hello world. And if we have a quick look at our function, it just is a function that says hello world. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe and maybe even drop a like.